What's good, Judson? Hey. Good morning. Hey. Wow, these lights are bright. And it's such a joy for me to be here with you. Uh, I want to extend my greetings from Wheaton College, where I oversee our discipleship efforts. I also want to thank Chris for extending the kind invitation for me to be here with you and open God's Word together. Uh, in my conversations with him, what I've come away, what I come away with every time is that it's abundantly clear that he is a deeply thoughtful follower of Christ who loves all of you dearly. And so you're blessed to have him here. Today we're going to be looking at John 17. So if you have your Bibles, would you open them there? We're going to be reading from uh, the last prayer that Jesus prayed. Actually, would you stand for the reading of God's word? When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you, for I have given them the words that you gave me. And they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those who you given, who, whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them. And not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, but that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the word, world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they may also be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you that they may also be one in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me, and love them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with them where I am, to see my Glory that you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you. And these, and these know that you sent me. I may know to them your name and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved, loved me may be in them and I in them. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Last words are important. They reveal a lot about a person. For example, some people utilize their last moments to display their sense of humor. Last year, a movie came out about a group of friends that had played a game of tag for, ten, for several decades. Anyone see it, the movie Tag? Yeah. You shouldn't have seen it. It's rated R. <laughs> well, in the... Late 1800s to the early 1900s, Richard B. Mellon, think Carnegie Mellon, and his brother Andrew had a 70-year game of tag going on. 
towards the end of his life, when Richard was on his deathbed, he called his, over, his, called his brother over and then whispered in his ear, last tag. And then he passed. Andrew was it until he died four years later. Then there was the murderer James uh, W. Rogers, who was put in front of a firing squad in Utah and asked if he had a last request. His response? Bring me a bulletproof vest. <laughs> there was also Luis Marie Therese de Saint Maurice, I don't know if I said that right, who, while she was on her deathbed, let one rip. To this, she said, Good, a woman who can fart is not dead. <laughs> now, these are, pretty witty re <laughs> these are pretty witty responses, but I doubt that most people would use their last words to crack a joke. My sense is that the majority of people who know they are approaching their last breath will say something that leaves a deep impression on the lives of those they love. Typically, when you know that your time is coming to an end, you take advantage of every moment you've got. When your time is about to expire, you squeeze as much as you can out of each and every minute. When you are about to die, you don't waste your words. When your time is winding down, you share the things you believe are most essential for your loved ones to know. For example, U.S. Secretary of State William Henry Seward was asked if he had any final words. He replied, nothing. Then he said, only love one another. When abolitionist Harriet Tubman was dying in 1913, she gathered her family around her and led them in a song. This was how she wanted to leave her loved ones behind. Her last words were, swing low, sweet chariot. The president of another Christian college shared an article where he talked about the last words his grandmother, who could no longer persist through dialysis, spoke. The last words that she spoke to him were, go and live the life that God has called you to. As he reflected on the words that she spoke, he realized that she shared what she believed was most important for him to know, something that would keep his eyes on Jesus and his attention on fulfilling the mission of God. Well, this was true of Jesus too. See, here in John 17 are a few of Jesus' last words. This prayer is the concluding segment of Jesus' farewell discourse, which began in John chapter 13. Here, Jesus is, with his, Jesus is with his disciples to partake in a final meal and share in his final teaching right before the crucifixion. In essence, Jesus knows the end is coming. He knows that, the, that he is about to be betrayed arrested, put on trial, and then unjustly crucified on a cross. And in this moment, as he gathers with all of his disciples for a last time, he shares his last words. From chapters 13 to 17, Jesus shares what is deepest in his heart. He talks about the sending forth of his Holy Spirit, the joy of abiding in God, and the promise of the persecution to come. Then as we see in the shift from chapter 16 to 17, Jesus transitions from discourse to prayer. And as important as last words are, so are last prayers. Now for those of us who are unfamiliar with the passage, this is one of the most beautiful passages in all of Scripture. In John 17, Jesus gives his disciples then and now a glimpse into his communion with God. This is the longest recorded prayer in all of the prayer of Jesus in all of Scripture, and in it we are invited into the to, invited to hear the words Jesus offers to the Father. Here Jesus prays that the Father's plan would be accomplished through the ministry of the Son, as we see in verse one through five, through the ministry of His apostles, as we see in verses six to nineteen. But in our time together, we're going to fo be focusing on verses twenty to twenty-six, where Jesus prays that the Father's plan would be accomplished through the ministry of all believers. In verse twenty, Jesus says, "I do not ask for these only." these being his disciples, but also for those who believe in me through their word. Here, Jesus is referring to you and to me. The statement, those who believe in me through their word, includes those of us in this room who believe in the name of Jesus. 
you and I get a special shout out uh, in this prayer. Jesus gives a special mention. What's amazing is that in this prayer some 2,000 years ago, Jesus had you and me in mind as he prayed to the Father in the presence of his disciples. And in this chapter that's all about glory, we are included. And we learn that the glory of God is demonstrated by the unity of the church. This is why in verse 21, Jesus prays for those who will believe in him through the word of his apostles that they may all be one. Jesus' final prayer for all of us is that we would be one. And we see it again in verse 22 when Jesus says, The glory given to him by the Father is the glory he has given to us so that we might be one as he and the Father are one. Now we must be clear that our unity as believers is neither self-generated nor is it an end in and of itself. Our unity is a result of our union with God. But this is what Jesus prays for, a unity among believers that reflects our union with God. So in verse 23, Jesus again repeats this desire for his disciples to be unified. He prays, I in them and you, speaking to the Father in me, that they may become perfectly one. And then he gives the reason for this unity. That the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. Here... Jesus makes it abundantly clear that his desire for all those who claim to know him would be that they are one so that as, as he and the Father are one. So that the world might know that, he, that the Father sent him and loved them as the Father loved the Son. For God so loved the world, Jesus said. You see, Jesus prays that his disciples would be unified as he is unified with the Father because Christian unity serves as a testament to the sacrificial love of God. Christian unity serves as a witness to God. Christian unity displays the perfect unity of the Godhead. When we are united, we display the gospel. When we are united, we reveal the glory of God. But let us be clear that this unity grounded on the truth of the gospel is not an invisible unity. As D.A. Carson writes, this unity is to function as a witness before the watching world. Indeed, one might argue that it is the characteristic mark of the believing community. Therefore, the outward manifestation of the spiritual unity is a compelling witness. He continues, as Christians, the things which tie believers together are far more significant than the things that divide them. There ought to be among Christians, uh, among Christ's people, a sincere kinship, a mutual love, a common commitment, a deep desire to learn from, uh, from one another, and to come, if at all, to a shared understanding of the truth on any point. Such unity ought to be so transparent and compelling that others are attracted to it. Christian unity points people to Jesus. This is why the Nicene Creed identifies the four marks of the church as Catholic, meaning universal, holy, meaning a set apart for God, apostolic, meaning rooted in the teachings of the apostles, and one, which means unified. This is because Christian unity in love is so otherworldly that only the truth of Christ is sufficient to explain it. And it is this unity that Christ prays for and invites us to participate in. This is staggering, just utterly staggering. Sadly, though, it doesn't take much to see that Christians, including those of us who might identify with the evangelical Protestant stream, are not unified. Our unity was Jesus' dying request but we have demonstrated over and over that we are incapable of granting it. You glance at Christianity in the United States and more broadly in the West, and you will see that we are far from the unity that Christ prayed for. In fact, some might say that the church is as divided, if not more divided, than the unbelieving world. Not only are we split across the Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant lines, but we are also divided along denominational ones. As Peter Lightheart would say, we operate in a Christianized Babel. Lightheart writes, all about division, denominationalism is not what Jesus desires for his church. 
It does not fulfill his prayer. Denominationalism does not produce a church that is united as the Father is united with the Son and the Son with the Father. Then he goes on to say, denominational is not union. It is the opposite. It is the institutionalization of division. And to those who might argue that our unity is invisible, Lightheart would suggest an invisible unity is not a biblical unity. These words are words that we must all deeply consider. But beyond the fractures that have emerged along denominational lines, which have often emerged through reasonable theological differences, the church is also divided in other ways, ways that are not reasonable and have never been reasonable. Take partisan politics, for example. According to my colleague at Wheaton College, professor science, political science professor, Kristen Garrett, for many people, Party affiliation has become a stronger source of their identity than race, ethnicity, and religion. Think about what this means. If what she's saying is true, which it is, this means that some of us in here have a deeper, deeper, deeper allegiance to our political party than our faith in Jesus Christ. She continues, some people's partisanship is so foundational to them that it shapes their non-political judgments and behaviors. For example, both Democrats and Republicans believe the economy is doing better when their party controls the White House. They tend to judge criminal acts less harshly when someone from their own party commits them, and they are more likely to date, interesting, and make purchases from members of their own party. Partisans also often feel like it's justified to be hostile towards their opponents. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with my own students who have shared that they grew up in churches where, there's this, where the theology of their church seemed to be shaped more, that, more by partisan loyalty than biblical fidelity. If you look through each party's platform, it's abundantly clear that for the follower of Christ, neither the far left or the far right are tenable positions then. As Charlie Dates, who will be coming later this week, tweeted earlier, to be exclusively politically conservative or liberal at all times is, at once to be un is, 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 that, is, is to be at once biblically unfaithful. But we're not just divided along political lines, are we? How many churches are there where the rich and the poor worship as one? How often do you see the rich and the poor in authentic community together? More than anything, people try to get rich so they can distance themselves from the poor, not so that they can get more proximate. As one pastor said, it's harder for me to get the rich to be in a, rich, in a worshiping community with the poor than just about anything else. Perhaps this is why Jesus would say that it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than a wealthy person to enter the kingdom of God. We don't see many churches where the rich and the poor are in mutually life-giving community together. But we also don't see many churches that cut across what W.E.B. Du Bois would call the color line in meaningful ways. Many of, you have, many of you have now heard the infamous statement that Martin Luther King Jr. said uh, about the 11 o'clock hour in America being one of the most segregated hours there is. The statement that he made over 50 years ago and what we, is what we continue to see today. It's sad that what he said over 50 years ago rings true to this day. You go into any neighborhood and you can easily determine which church is the black church and which church is the Korean church and which church is the white church and which church is the Latino church. A quick glance at the signage and you'll also see that in one building, multiple congregations of various races and ethnicities that all speak English worship separately. There are churches in my neighborhood where a White congregation worships at 9 a.m., a Korean congregation worships at 11 a.m., a Hispanic congregation worships at 2 p.m., and a Hmong congregation worships at 5 p.m. And when I see this, the words of Rudyard Kipling's Ballad of the East and the West rings in my ears. Oh, East is East, and West is West, and never the two shall meet. As Jesus prays, may they be one so that the world may believe, which we see in verse 21, and so that the world may know, which we see in verse 23, I often wonder, what does our segregation lead the world to believe? 
And what does it lead the world to know? If we look through the history of Christianity and native, in, in, among Native Americans, you'll see that one of the many reasons the gospel was obstructed among First Nations people in the United States was because of the visible disunity among Christians. A U.S. official once asked Nez Perce Chief Joseph why he had banned missionaries from the reservation. His response? Because missionaries will teach us to quarrel about God as Catholics and Protestants do. We do not want to learn that. We must quarrel with men sometimes about things on earth, but we must never quarrel about the Great Spirit. We do not want to learn that. Now, do not hear me saying that disputing important theology is not worthwhile. Nor, do you, nor should you hear that I am affirming that we should affirm what God does not affirm. But within the bounds of Scripture and orthodoxy, we should not tear apart. As I reflect on the state of Christianity in America and, and evangelicalism more specifically, and by evangelicalism I'm referring to those who might hold to the tenets of, uh, the, of biblical centrality, of, 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 uh, of a cruciform life and the centrality of the cross, of the importance of uh, sharing your faith and, and, and giving your life to Jesus and new birth, uh, as well as in, in terms of activism through missions and evangelism and social justice. I am, I am concerned that, that our long history of what I call segregated discipleship has led us into factions that we desperately need to mend. There has been a tear in the fabric of our visible oneness, with, in, oneness in Christ that, is, that has been shaped by our participation in racial injustice and unbiblical division that we have both inherited and, and perpetuated. For example, as I look at the black church in America, I both celebrate and lament. I celebrate because of the rich legacy of bold and faithful gospel preaching and gospel community embodied in the black church. Their contributions to the broader, church, the broader body of Christ are a source of deep wealth and insight that all of us can learn from. But I wonder how many of you know that the black church emerged because the white church excluded them from meaningful participation, both in service and in leadership. In the 1780s, Richard Allen and Absalom Jones were preachers within the Methodist Episcopal Church in Philadelphia. However, they were limited to only speaking at early morning services. Though they attracted many people to the church, blacks were not allowed into the main worship space. They were instead relegated along the wall of the balcony on the top. Then when white churches and white church members would yank black congregants off of their knees while they were praying. Imagine that. While someone is praying, they were yanked off of their knees. The blacks began to realize how far whites would go in order to enforce racial segregation and racial supremacy over blacks. This led both Allen and Jones to leave the church and eventually establish the Free African Society, the FAS, which eventually birthed the African Methodist Episcopal Church, or what we know as the AME. The AME today is a denomination which now has more than 7,000 churches and over 2.5 million members worldwide. Think about that. The segregation we see today is a result of a few people refusing to embrace the racial and ethnic diversity in their midst about 200 plus years ago. And this is just one black denomination. Now some might say, well that was the past. This is now. Why do you even bring up the past? Well first of all, the past bleeds into the present as the present will lead into the future. Secondly, it doesn't take much to see that Christianity in America today is broadly divided along racial lines. What's troublesome is how some people don't see this form of voluntary segregation as problematic. They have bought into the false idea that voluntary segregation is a form of natural sorting where like attracts like. But to this I ask, how is the gospel's power on display when people are drawn to people that, like, that are like them or like people who simply like them back? As Jesus would say, even sinners do that. Again, as Jesus prays, so that the world may know. 
But what the world seems to know is that Christians are as divided, if not more divided, than the whole of an unbelieving society. Data around multi-ethnic churches reveal that less than 20% of Protestant churches in the United States are diverse. This means that over 80% of the churches in America are still dominated by one race or ethnicity. Now, before you think this is because of much of America lacks diversity, consider the findings of Kevin Doherty, a sociologist at Baylor, who reported that the average congregation in America is four times less diverse than the neighborhood it resides. All across America, the churches are more segregated than the neighborhoods they are in. And over the 25 years of studying multi-ethnic churches and diversity within Christianity, the provost of North Park, Michael Emerson, who's also a sociologist, uh, he found that diver the diversity we see in our churches is primarily the result of Christians of color attending white churches, but not with white Christians attending churches that are led by Christians of color. This means that the diversity we see within evangelicalism and Protestantism more broadly is the result of people of color willing to enter spaces that are not shaped, defined, and led, uh, and, and that, are, that are shaped, led, and, defi and, and defined by white people, but not vice versa. Further, Emerson, as Emerson continues, as a whole, multi-ethnic congregations tend to serve merely as a tool into white assimilation since African Americans are more likely than the white majority to adjust their views as a result of attendance. What this means is that at present moment, on Christians, uh, that the burden of a diverse worshiping community falls on Christians of color to attend, to participate in, and to worship in dominantly white settings. The studies show that, generally speaking, the reverse is not true as white Christians tend not to attend churches where they are the minority. In fact, even in a prominent Christian ministry that has campus ministries all across the country, what they have found is when people of color make up more than 40% of their fellowship at any given campus, white flight takes place. This is today. This means when diversity rises among, among these groups, white Christians leave because it, makes, because it starts to feel uncomfortable for them. Study after study, report after report, history page after history page, we see the same patterns emerge. We find a cycle where people of color are looking to worship together in unity with our, with, with, with our white brothers and sisters, but by and large, when it feels like there are too many people of color, White brothers and sisters leave. Unfortunately, we're also now seeing the same trends the other way too, where people of color are departing from white evangelicalism. All of this should break all of our hearts. So that the world may know, Jesus said. But what is it that the world will come to know through this? Now, I'm not saying any of this to make any of you, uh, if you're white, to feel guilty or condemned. I'm also not saying any of this to, if you're a person of color, to feel guilty or if we're wanting to leave. Um, all I'm doing is simply presenting the facts so that we can, encur we can be encouraged to move forward together. I share this because all I want is to walk into God's eternal kingdom hand in hand with my brothers who are black and sisters who are Latino and Latina and Asian and First Nation and Middle Eastern and white all together in Christ. But in order for this to happen, we must all come together, we must all stay together, and we must do everything we can so that we do not become a stumbling block to one another. Walter Brueggemann wrote that the prophetic task of the church is to tell the truth in the society that lives in illusion, grieve in a society that practices denial, and express hope in a society that lives in despair. In my experience, the greatest challenges to this occurs when the church itself lives in an illusion, practices denial, and lives in despair. My hope is that as we speak truth to one another, we will proclaim the truth of the gospel to a lost world through our unity. But how do we do this? 
How do we move forward in a way that presses into the unity that Christ established on our behalf? Again, as Jesus said, may they be one so that the world might know. Well, first, I think it's appropriate to pause and lament where we are. It's appropriate to lament the fact that when non-Christians look into the windows of American Christianity, what they see is division and not unity. They see that we are divided along all sorts of lines and in divided times see that the church is not a solution towards healing. If you don't believe me, ask any of the non-Christian friends in here whether they think it's true or not. But also we can learn from Jesus' own example on the night of his, on, uh, on the night of his betrayal. If we turn back a few pages in the, book of, in, in the book of John to chapter 13, we will see that Jesus begins, with, begins the evening by washing the feet of his disciples. The disciples were gathered in the upper room, and, and as they looked around for the t- traditional servant to wash their feet, Jesus takes off his cloak, walked over to the washstand, wrapped a towel around his waist, picked up the basin of water, and then began washing his disciples' feet. This was scandalous on the part of Jesus. This is why Peter rebukes Jesus for doing such a thing. Foot washing was a practice reserved for the lowliest of servants, not for the Son of God. But Jesus responded by telling him that this was essential to his ministry. This act was a shocking demonstration of love, a symbol of saving grace, and a model of Christian conduct. There is no doubt that this experience was running through their minds as Jesus was teaching them and praying with them that night. As he was talking about abiding and persecution to come and the sending forth of his Holy Spirit, Jesus' foot washing would have been coming to their minds. There is no doubt that this one event defined the mood of the entire evening and shaped their ministry for the rest of their lives. This is why in Philippians 2, Paul tells us we need to model ourselves after Jesus, who did nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility humility counted others more significant than himself. Paul writes, let each of you not look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. This is what Jesus modeled both in the washing of his disciples' feet and as he marched to his own death on the cross. And this only happened because he counted us more significant than himself. For Jesus, the path to unity was always justice. Justice that was paid for on the cross. If we truly care about the glory of God, we will care about unity. And if we care about unity, we must also care about justice which includes racial justice. For the, path to unity, uh, for the path to unity for Jesus was on a cross that cried out for justice. Jesus satisfied the just wrath of God and by his humble sacrifice brought us into perfect union with him. It was only because Jesus gave his life for us by assuming the lowliest position that we are justified in him through faith and then granted an elevated eternity with him. It is from this place that we can consider others more significant than ourselves and seek their interests above our own, as we saw in Philippians 2. It's also how we can bear each other's burdens, referring to the burdens that we cannot bear alone, as we see in Galatians 6. And this is how we can give greater honor to the members of the body who lack it, as we are called to in 1 Corinthians 12. Now, if there's anyone in here who feels like this is impossible, well, welcome to the club. Right? This type of humility, sacrifice, and selflessness is impossible without Jesus. True unity is impossible without him. Jesus knew, though, that the way to glory was through humiliation. He knew that the way to life was through the darkness of death. He knew that the path towards unity was always through the gates of justice. So he gave his life as a ransom so that we might have eternal life in him. And it is from this place that we live, our, we, we live our lives in utter abandon to him. 
As Fleming Rutledge writes, you can be sure that the Lord is already at work to break down those barriers and create in you the mind of Christ. This very day, he might be calling you to perform the miracle of love and humility. May your generation be the generation that takes the divided factions of our faith and humbly stitch us back together for the sake of God's glory and the witness of the church so that the world might know who sent Christ down for us. Let's pray. God, I pray that we would be one as you and the Father are one so that the world might know and believe that the Father sent you for our sake and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go in peace.